Today we're going to be talking about surgery of the cervical spine or neck. We're going to be discussing different approaches to operating on the cervical disc, including fusions of the cervical spine and artificial disc replacement, which is called arthroplasty. Uh, today we're going to be discussing this type of surgery with a patient of mine who's been very kind in agreeing to come here and discuss his symptoms. So I'm happy to welcome Gino Lucadamo here. Thanks, Gino, for being here. Oh, you're welcome. And discussing with us um, your problem, what you went through. Um, I saw you several years ago, in fact, as a patient when you had a herniated lumbar disc. That's correct, I did. And fortunately, you recovered well from that. Yes, very so, well. So you then developed a problem in your neck. Can you describe for us what your symptoms were and uh, what you discovered was the problem? And how you discovered it? Yeah, well, it, it, was, it was a little weird because I, I actually woke up one morning and I thought I slept on my wife's pillow. I had a crick in my neck and that's all I thought it really was. Uh, but it progressively got worse over really just a couple of days and I got this burning uh, in my arm and, and then when the burning would go away, it, it, was, uh, it was like my arm fell completely asleep and I would have to keep trying to shake it. How long after you developed that crick in your neck did that happen? By the way, was your wife upset about the idea that you might have slept on her pillow? Well, actually, she was quite upset. <laughs> but Very I, particular about their pillows, right? Yes, they are. Uh, and that's why I got the crick. But uh, no, it's, uh, it, it took probably about a week to get to where it was so painful that I, I, I really knew I had to see somebody. Uh, I'm not one to jump and run to a doctor. As you know, uh, I'm a pretty good... I can handle pain, pain pretty well. In fact, it's interesting because the story that you give of the progression of your symptoms is pretty common. People generally start with a relatively mild pain or a symptom, like a crick in the neck, and right. then it progresses over several days and can even progress over months. So even though the event itself of a herniation can be abrupt, it's interesting that the symptoms can indeed progress over time. So, so once you started to get the symptoms in your arm, then what did you do there? Well, w what, once that, that week was up, um, th there was, when my arm would wake up, it was, you, you know when your, your foot or something falls asleep and it wakes sure. up, there's that real bad pain that you go through. And this was, by the f end of the first week, this is where I was. So I had to go through the routine of, I believe you were on vacation, because you were the first guy I thought about calling. Uh, so I called my primary, and I went through that whole routine with the with the re MRIs and things. And what did your primary recommend, your your internist? Did he have any specific treatments to suggest at that point? Uh, no, he thought I should see somebody who knew what they were talking about, and he mentioned, uh, uh, you know, to see you. So he recognized already that you must have a compression of a nerve coming from the neck. That's correct. Um, did you feel any weakness in your arm? Well, total weakness when it was sleeping. I, mean, I, I couldn't, I had no feeling. Uh, once it would fall asleep, I would just have to just shake it just to try to get it to kind of like wake up. Because it, it's interesting, aside from the numbness that you experience, sometimes patients, in fact, don't recognize the weakness. And when they come into the office and I examine them, they're surprised to see how much weakness they in fact have because they're not using the arm as, as much. And because of the pain and because of the numbness that you described, they're more attuned to that than the actual strength, but the muscle indeed often, and several muscles, depending on which nerve is affected, will get weak. I don't think I realized uh, how weak it was until I saw you that first day because you took me into the examination room. I, you probably don't remember, but you asked me just to push on your hands with my hands. And that was kind of like really the end of your test with me. You said you have no power. You have, you have nothing in your right arm. And I didn't realize it was That's that right. your substantial. Triceps, your triceps was pretty much out. Yeah. So you didn't have any other treatments such as physical therapy or chiropractic treatment? I went to a chiropractor once because you were on vacation waiting to get to see you before my MRI. And uh, he put me on the table and he said, you have to get off the table. I can't touch you. Uh, a good chiropractor, it, yeah. <laughs> recognizing that there yeah. was indeed a problem with pressure on the nerve. Yeah. So it is common for people to seek other treatment before surgery, and if the symptoms aren't that profound that they can't function at all, 
it's often reasonable to try physical therapy or chiropractic and to try anti-inflammatories because initially when you have that herniation there's a lot of pain but over time that herniation which we discussed at another educational session shrinks somewhat and the pressure and nerve can be relieved right. the physical therapy and the chiropractic treatments aren't made to make that herniation go away because they can't your body has to do it on its own but with the physical therapy or the chiropractic it can help to reduce the inflammation and relieve the pressure on the nerve and thereby help reduce the symptoms. So you had to be seen quite quickly and you had that weakness and you had pain that was really incapacitating to you, right? That's correct, it was. So you came in and we, I examined you, we talked about what you had, the pathology that you had, the herniated disc, the extruded fragment, and we talked about the surgical options. Correct. So do you recall what the options were that we discussed and what your thoughts were about those? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I remember them very distinctly. Uh, what, what, what you, you just told me right away what I needed. Um, I was hoping you'd say try physical therapy or try something else, but you said, no, you need to have your disc replaced. And uh, I know you caught me off guard. Uh, it was on a Friday. And uh, I went home and I just, you got to be kidding me, you know? And uh, so I had a chance to go online and look to see what you were talking about. I'd wait till Monday to call you. Uh, and if you remember, I called you on Monday and said, can I try something else? And you said, no, there's nothing else you can try. And you were right. I, 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 I knew that then, and I knew that now, but it was such a procedure that I was concerned about, but it really wasn't that and, big of a procedure. And I have to say, I am a conservative surgeon, and I tend to try to have patients wait at least six weeks after their initial symptoms to see if they do resolve. But there are times when you really have to be on top of it and where there's no point in waiting and that's when there is significant weakness of the muscle and when there's such debilitating pain that it can't function either and when there's a herniation that you can clearly identify on an MRI right. that is large and you don't expect it to shrink sufficiently and certainly if it's also pressing on the spinal cord which wasn't in your case that's urgent as well so the options then as we discussed are to remove the disc and fuse it or to put in an artificial disc. So when we do a, a fusion, we take out the disc, which we do through an incision in the front of that. Can you show your incision? If it's hard I to see. Probably could. I don't know if can you see it from here or should I unbutton there. it? Can you I see think it? It, I can see it. Okay. It's a yeah. small incision along the... Yeah, it's only about an inch. Right. Along a, a skin crease. And then um, we go down to the spine remove that disc under the microscope remove we remove the piece of disc that's pushing on the nerve and then we can either put in a device referred to as a cage to hold the disc space open and we lock it in place with plates and your bone grows through there and fuses it or we can now put it in an artificial disc which is what we did in your case an artificial disc is a device we put in when we've removed the disc that allows for the disc to continue moving the advantage of it is, as, as I mentioned to you, that in my opinion, it makes it, and, and the research studies so far have shown that this is indeed the case, that it makes it a bit less likely for adjacent discs to then deteriorate because there's less stress on the adjacent discs when this disc is still able to move. I think it's still important to have physical therapy after that, which we've which discussed. So you opted to go ahead with this artificial disc. Correct. What made you decide to, to go with that route? Well, it, for, for me, I think it was a uh, relatively easy decision um, because I'm very, active, I'm very active in sports. Uh, I play tennis quite a bit. I'm a runner, um, and I also uh, play golf. Uh, so uh, I, I, I've always had this, this, this worry about a fusion with losing restriction. And uh, discussing it with you, um, as far as get, having this replacement disc, uh, there wouldn't be any restriction. Um, and, uh, and also the recovery time was, was very, very fast compared to a fusion as well. What was the experience for you of actually having the surgery? Before, during, or after? Uh, well, before you were probably a bit nervous because most people are understandably nervous. Correct. When they're lying there in preoperative holding area, I tell them it's actually the bed. Everyone who's in that particular bed gets nervous, so it must be something about the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I, I actually have to be honest with you. I, I, I watch procedures on it and talking to you. 
you did a surgery on me before, um, and you're not quick to cut. Um, that I know, you've told me with my back. Uh, but uh, I really wasn't nervous about the surgery. I was in such pain, I knew I had to have it done. Uh, so I really never had a ner I didn't really have any nervousness about going into that surgery, even in the bed when you came and you autographed my neck. Um, I do remember waking up in recovery room and the nurse woke me up and she asked me a question. I said, wait one second. And I just, I moved my arm. And she says, are you okay? And I said, I am fantastic. I had all the feeling in my arm and I had no pain in my arm. It is dr it's it was dramatic, was instantaneous. Isn't it? I, I was, and she looked at me and I, I just said, I'm happy, <laughs> you know, and I, and I was. Um, as far as afterwards, um, it's such a, it, it, I woke up the next, I had such a good night's sleep, uh, the nurses wanted me to take the pain medication with me. And I don't take pain medication. But I picked it up, we took it home, and uh, I, I slept all through the night with just a couple of Tylenols. I woke up the next morning, I was fine. As a matter of fact, I had company come to the house to say, hey, how are you? Relatives came, some people from business came, and uh, I got up, I made coffee, I made tea, I was doing great, but four o'clock came, I don't know what happened, I was in agony. <laughs> But it was my own fault. I just did too much. And because I, I was able to move, there's no neck braces, no nothing with this surgery. It's fantastic. Um, I was playing tennis within two months. What's great is that the majority of the time, once you've relieved the pressure on the nerve, the nerve can come back very quickly. So that what you've experienced with the feeling coming back and the strength coming back is the usual finding after this kind of surgery. Occasionally, there's been so much compression for so long with so much uh, irritation in the nerve that the nerve can actually be damaged and it can take longer to recover. The experience of getting pain after the surgery is also common because the initial inflammation actually increases over a day or two, just like when you have a bruise anywhere, you notice that the swelling is greater a day right. or so later. So there's gonna be more swelling in the neck. The muscles then react to reduce the movement because of the inflammation and irritation. The muscles tighten up and you get the pain. So I tend to tell patients that they should expect that they'll have some pain back behind their neck after the surgery, and that can take days or weeks even to start to dissipate. And that's also why I like people to start physical therapy afterwards, not only to help with reduction of the post-operative pain, but also to start strengthening those muscles that support your head and neck so that your movement is optimized down the line. Right. So how are you feeling now? Fantastic. Wonderful. Fantastic. I'm very happy. So <laughs> that, am I. Of course, so am I. <laughs> we're both pleased with that. Yeah. Um, hopefully you're doing your exercises. I'm doing more than my exercises. I know you're very I, happy. I'm back into my routine. So That's great. It's, it's really going very um, well. I want you to understand that it's important for you to continue with those exercises so that you keep your neck in balance and hopefully won't have other problems with other discs in your right. neck. Thanks so much for coming and sharing that with us. Oh, you're it's very welcome. It's been very valuable, I'm sure.